Hello, everyone, and thank you once again for joining us for this month's Can Journal Club, hosted by the Cannabis Chemistry Subdivision at the American Chemical Society. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to make sure that you all knew that we have a very exciting symposium coming up. So we have the ACS National Meeting between the 23rd and 25th of August. You can join virtually or in person in Chicago. You do need to be registered to attend, so don't wait till the last minute to get it set up. We're hosting two themes across three days. On Tuesday is going to be latest developments in cannabis science and sustainability, also known as the identification and analytics session. On Wednesday, we have a session called Blazing Trails, Cannabis Chemistry and Post-Secondary Education, super cool. And on Thursday, we have the latest developments in cannabis science and sustainability the session also known as the higher level extraction, purification, and molecular classification session. So if that's your vibe, that's definitely your day. All times uh, are going to be in central slash Chicago time, are listed under CHAS 007 and 008. CHAS stands for the Chemical Health and Safety Division, which is uh, what we are a subdivision of. So we really encourage you all to attend. If you have any questions, email programming at can-acs.org. Uh, once again, we are the Cannabis Chemistry Subdivision at the American Chemical Society. If you're not an ACS member, we highly suggest you register and join our subdivision. So one day we will become our full-fledged own division. So we have a pretty great turnout today and we have a spectacular speaker. Uh, Twinkle Periani is here. Twinkle graduated from Colorado State University in 2018 with a PS in chemistry. She began her career in cannabis during her undergraduate research where she investigated the inhomogeneity of flower samples to help inform good sampling practices for regulators in Colorado. After graduation, Twinkle spent three and a half years working with the CDC conducting research on urinary VOC metabolites from tobacco. She then transitioned from working in analytical public health to working at a third party licensed testing lab in California and in 2022, she joined the Abstracts Tech team as a research and development scientist. She is currently helping standardize internal QC procedures as well as conducting research using two-dimensional gas chromatography. Uh, Twinkle's uh, passion is in public health and consumer safety, and she wants to make sure that science and research is accessible to all cannabis consumers and patients. So today she's going to be presenting on a research paper that sought to uncover the chemical origins of the skunk-like aroma in cannabis. The authors measured the aromatic properties of cannabis flowers and concentrated extracts using 2D GCMS TOF, uh, FID, and sulfur chemonium luminescence. I'm sure she can explain better what those are than I can. But these results shed light on the chemical origins of the characteristic aroma of cannabis and how volatile sulfur compound production uh, may be responsible for that aroma. So Twinkle, it's uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today. So we'll jump right into that. It was a great introduction. So like Andrew mentioned, this is a presentation on the novel volatile sulfur compounds in cannabis. And Andrew, Andrew did a great job with that introduction and my background. Um, and I just wanted to mention that I joined the Abstracts Tech team in 2022. And so I'm currently using um, this technology that we're gonna be talking about today to do further research, but I was not involved in the research or writing of this paper. So today I'm just pleased to be able to present Dr. Ian Oswald's and other collaborating authors um, research to you guys. So cannabis has many unique psychoactive properties um, thought to be enhanced by smell. It's been observed that many different chemical classes work together to create this effect. Cannabinoids, flavonoids, and terpenoids or terpenes. These are all secondary metabolites to the cannabis plant and may interact with each other synergistically. Um, cannabis also has an unusually wide genetic variation which we observe in this multitude of terpene expressions between cultivars or strains. Um, but despite the wide genetic variation and variety in terpene expressions, there is a somewhat specific and consistent smell between cultivars that's not been found elsewhere in nature. It's described as skunky or gas-like, and this characteristic association of the smell with cannabis has caused 
is something that's very desirable to consumers and it's caused it to be sought after historically and bred for its aroma producing properties in cultivars like OG Kush, Fatso and GMO. Like most things that we consume, aroma plays a major role in appetite and appeal. So you can tell, you can understand why the researchers of this paper were so interested in determining what is responsible for this aroma. So while the researchers of this paper were attempting to identify the source of this unknown gassy component, they wanted to rule out a few things about aroma that we do know. Scientists have been successful in identifying over 200 compounds endogenous to cannabis, many different classes of terpenes, some of which have been identified in other natural products. And these seven terpenes on the screen, beta myrosine, D-limonene, alpha and beta pinene, caryophylline, humulene, terpenoline, and linalool make up some of the highest concentration terpenoids in cannabis. So you may have heard of these seven or seen them on product labels in the state of California. And these seven compounds contribute to upwards of 50% of the aroma concentration in cannabis. Um, and actually only about one to 5% by weight of cannabis is terpenes and one to 15% by weight is terpenes in cannabis extracts. So really small fractions of weight um, of, these, of these cannabis flowers are responsible for the majority of the aroma that you detect. And abstracts is primarily a flavor house. And throughout their research, they made several attempts to mimic the smell of cannabis through botanically derived terpenes and isolates. But they always felt that something was missing and that they weren't able to comprehensively mimic cannabis the way they wanted to. And this was likely due to the gassy smell that they were missing. So they hypothesized that the gassy smell would be due to volatile sulfur compounds, like these that are exhibited elsewhere in nature. So they decided to investigate for sulfur containing aroma compounds in cannabis based on the fact that there's no clear evidence for terpenes or other identified compounds to produce this aroma. Therefore, it must be something difficult to detect or observe. And VSCs are responsible for pungent aroma other places in nature like durian, hops, garlic, onion, and skunks. And we know that the human nose can detect different thiols and sulfur containing compounds at concentrations below one part per billion. So in very low concentrations, these, these uh, suspected analytes may exist in these really small and hard to detect quantities. So on the bottom left, you can see that these are some sulfides that are present in garlic. And on the bottom right, these are thiols that are present in skunk spray. So the technology and methods that they used to find and identify these VSCs. Using two-dimensional gas chromatography, they were able to obtain excellent separation and they have a three detector capability where they can use three detectors in parallel. So there's the time of flight mass spectrometer used for compound identification, the flame ionization detector used for quantifying non-sulfur containing compounds and the sulfur chemoluminescence detector used for detecting and quantifying volatile sulfur containing compounds. The SCD can only detect compounds that contain sulfur. And this is important as they're usually in very low concentrations. So this is a nice picture over here of what the GC cross GC looks like. So here's the bench toff, and then here's the GC oven. And then this part right here is an automated sampler platform. And the SCD is actually just right here. And this is an um, direct injection auto sampler also. So the chemistry behind GC cross GC separation. Um, GC cross GC separation uses two different columns with two different stationary phases. In the first dimension, they use an apolar column. And in the second dimension, they use a polar column. The apolar column, um, separates by compound size, molecular weight, or boiling point, however you prefer to think about it. And in the second dimension, we separate by polarity. As, and as you increase in the y-axis, polarity increases. So you can see in this 
picture on the left here, there's a lot of different over overlapping compounds that exist in the headspace of cannabis that contain similar chemical structures. And the fact that all of these chemical structures are similar can make them hard to quantitate. So this is what um, a 1D GC chromatogram would look like. So this chromatogram contains about 45 different flavorants or terpenoids. Um, and you can see that there is a lot of coalition of peaks here. There's not great baseline separation. And in general, for a 30 minute run, this is a lot of compounds to identify or quantify. And these crowded regions are because of their structural similarities. Um, and here is a small diagram of how traditional 1G, 1DGC works. You have a carrier gas, a flow controller, your column in a column oven, which then leads to the detector that produces peaks. So one thing that I think is interesting, um, the state of California usually uses uh, one-dimensional GC testing to determine terpene labeling on products. So if you've seen terpene profiles on your products, those have been tested by 1DGC, and usually they only test for somewhere between 12 and 50 compounds. We know that there are over 200 compounds that contribute to this aroma, so we're really only learning about the small fraction of these aroma containing compounds that um, are in the highest quantity and contribute the most to these aromas that we smell. Okay. So this is a 2D chromatogram. Um, so like I said, uh, previously. In the x-axis, we have retention time in minutes, and in the y-axis, we have retention time in seconds, as opposed to traditional 1D, where in the y-axis, you have intensity. Um, if you look at this 3D intensity plot, it gives you a better idea of how to read this, kind of like a heat map with the white peaks being the most intense quantity of these compounds. Um, so you can see in the 3D plot that there's a lot of, there's a lot better separation. Um, we have a foreground and a background, and that allows us to elucidate compounds that are really similar in structure that would probably co-elute in 1DGC. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how you read this chromatogram on the left. So starting from the left and going to the right, you have the sol solvent or small molecule region, the monoterpene or monoterpenoid region, and the sesquiterpene and sesquiterpenoid region. Um, and then going from the bottom to the top, so increasing in polarity, you have small molecules, then small molecules, small molecular al alcohols or other polar compounds, and then multiple alcohols or acid functionalized groups. That would be in this region here, multiple alcohol or acid functionalized groups, and then terpenes, monoterpenoids, larger alcohols, and nonlinear alcohols. So 2DGC gives us better separation and higher fidelity, but how do we find these sulfur-containing compounds? Or how did the researchers in this paper find these sulfur-containing compounds? And also, what makes up the GC? So there's a lot of moving parts in this. Um, so there's the Century Auto Sampler, an automated sample introduction platform that utilizes headspace. Um, then there's the GC Cross GC, which is just the GC oven with two different columns in it, and that those two columns are connected by the ultimate union. Um, the ultimate union is a ferruling piece that's able to connect two different columns together to create a single flow path, flow path between them. Then you have the time of flight mass spectrometer. Um, used to identify unknown compounds with more accuracy. The flame ionization detector, which is used to quantify unknown compounds, and the SCD, which is used to quantify and identify sulfur-containing compounds. Oh, and I also, sorry, skipped the Subsolve Insight flow modulator, which controls flow and analyte direction between columns, inlets, and outlets. So this is, a di uh, this is a slide on the headspace analysis of volatiles. So on the left here, 
you can see that you have your sample in the solid or liquid phase. The non-volatiles remain in this sample as they are heated and agitated by your auto sampler. The heat and agitation help bring volatile analytes in the sample into equilibrium with the headspace. These are usually 20 mil headspace files. And then a needle and syringe inject into that and draw up some of the headspace in this file. Then they deposit it onto a trap, which is then focused and injected into the GC. In this paper, they talk about the fact that they have two different sample prep methods. Um, and basically they do that so that they can play to the strength of their detectors. They know that for SCD um, data, these comp these sulfur-containing compounds are gonna be in very low concentration. So to give them the best chance of being able to see these compounds, they wanna load up as much of these analytes onto the column as possible. So they enlisted this high loading sample method where they placed a neat sample, just raw cannabis flower into a headspace file and then injected the headspace above that. They also used enrichments, which is just multiple injections to really give themselves as much concentration on the column as possible. Then they used this low loading method to quantify samples, excuse me, to quantify analytes that exist in much higher concentrations. So regular terpenoids, terpenes, and flavorants that they know exist and they know they have the capability to see with their two other detectors that are in much higher concentration. They were able to dissolve the sample into a solvent and then take an aliquot of that and place it into the headspace. Then the same thing happens. They inject the headspace from that into the column. And this is about how sulfur chemiluminescence detection works. So the compound passes through GC cross GC. The sulfur containing compound then reacts with oxygen to form SO2 which reacts with hydrogen to form SO, which reacts with ozone to create SO2 in the excited state. The excited state SO2 then returns to ground state and releases UV light, which is then detected by the sulfur chemoluminescence detector. Um, and then you can see here that there is a chromatogram or some spectra from the SCD on the bottom left, where they've identified some of these compounds here. The detection wavelength that they're looking for for this luminescence from the um, release of the excited state to the ground state is between 300 and 400 nanometers. And the response by the detector is a linear and equi equimolar response to sulfur compounds. So they put it all together and use the combination of their mass spec data and their SCD data to give them a better idea. So on the top, you can see that the SCD shows a peak for any compound that contains sulfur, and then they're able to correlate that with the mass spec data below and identify these peaks in the mass spectra. Then they can find spectra for these and, in a, and attempt to use the spectra to solve structures for these unknown compounds. So they were able to identify some of these compounds and then they were set up with the challenge of solving for the structures. So using mass spectra to try to elucidate these structures of sulfur containing compounds, they said that one of the main things that helped them to do this was being able to see the similarities and differences between spectra, as well as seeing the molecular ion differences. So the parent ion weights. Um, so they noticed that they see lots of these common ion, mass to charge ions, 41, 69, and 101. Um, they hypothesize that this likely means that there are similarities in the structures and that they all contain these similar structural components, which are known as the prenal functional group. Um, they also denote that in VSC6 and VSC7 on the bottom, that the intensity of the 69 ion is twice as intense in VSC3 in the top left. And so they suppose that that must mean that there are two of these prenal groups. And as you can see that the structures next to them, that was absolutely true. So these spectra in combination with the ability to differentiate by polarity in the second dimension using GC cross GC really gave them the best chance of being able to solve what these structures could be and identify these compounds. 
So they, they were able to identify this entire new family of cannabis specific compounds, which they named cannasulfur compounds. Um, through sensory paneling and correlating that data with uh, data that came from the instrumentation, they, that they, they were able to determine a strong correlation between the pungent and characteristic gas smell to VSC3, 3-methyl-2-butene-1-thiol. They also said that VSC5 closely resembled the scent of VSC3, but was not quite as potent or pungent. Um, they also identified unique combinations of, this, of these VSCs in different cultivar and expressed that they, were, they only found VSC4 in one of the 13 different cultivars that they measured. So this is a slide on correlating analytics and sensory data. And this is just something that I thought was really cool and unique and something that I had not considered a lot of before I started doing this research um, with them. So they suspected the existence of some VSC compounds due to the human detector, the nose. So then they used sensory data to procure possible samples that may contain these compounds. They then that then found themselves with the need to detect low concentration sulfur compounds. So they enlisted the help and developed analytic techniques and instrumentation that could do this. But then they, they needed to do, they needed these two things to work together to be able to acquire meaningful data and the ability to correlate and understand results from the, from the combination of sensory and analytic data. So not only did they have to spend time doing method development and trying to ponder which detectors would be great for identifying these compounds and how they can analytically quantify them. But they also needed to conduct their experiments in such a way that the data they collected would be meaningful and be representative of trends or patterns, correlations in nature that they're trying to identify. And that, um, that the data that they should produce would be representative of the natural processes of interest. So. I just think that this is really interesting and um, it's a part of analytic chemistry that we don't often think of when people say method development, but without the correlation of these two uh, unique components, we may not have been able to identify these compounds. So they then took and procured um, three, sorry, 13 different cannabis cultivars and they were able to find some clear trends in the data. So on the left is a table that shows all the cultivar names and the sample age, and then how they rated them as an olfactory score through sensory paneling. And on the right is data from the SCD, which shows VSC concentration as a function of peak intensity in each of these different cultivar. So you can see as the cultivar goes down the table, there is less intensity in these SCD peaks. And these were the results that they came up with. The sensory panel was true to test that the cultivars that didn't appear gassy or skunky did not contain any VSCs. And the higher the rating on the olfactory score, the more VSCs were present in those samples. They also noticed a trend between these um, within this data. They measured the same cultivar 42 days apart and um, detected that since sensorily, the olfactory score decreased, as well as the total detection of VSCs decreased by about a third in that 42-day period, which leads them to believe that these VSCs rapidly deplete. And in the beginning of this paper, they hypothesized that these compounds may be similar to those in garlic, durian, hops, and skunks, and they were correct after identifying these compounds. You can see that on the left, we have all the VSCs that exhibit that are exhibited in cannabis. And on the right, we have VSCs that are exhibited in garlic that are um, responsible for its smell and also proposed health benefits. So you can see on the left, these are analogs that contain a prenal functional group. And on the right, they contain an allele functional group. And this is that same prenal functional group that I was mentioning. Um, and you can see that there are all these different compounds that exhibit them. And this is important because in biochemistry, 
prenylation of proteins increases lipophilicity. So that gives them some kind of more insight into why this might be favorable for cannabis to produce, but they can only hypothesize about that right now. And here are some other prenyl containing cannabis compounds, um, canflavin B, CBG, and CBC. Um, they all contain this prenyl group. So they're hoping that this work will help to give some context that we may be able to find out why the prenyl group is bi biosynthesized so ubiquitously. Then the researchers decided, well, okay, we, we purchased all these cultivars from the marketplace. We were able to identify VSCs in them. How can we take this a step further and identify them and monitor them as a function of plant growth? So they enlisted the help of an indoor grow and they planted four clones using OG cultivar. Then they monitored VSC function as, as a function of flowering time. So for the first, excuse me. So for the first week of flowering, um, you can see, you can see that they were not able to detect VSCs and they really started to be able to monitor these flowers after week two of flowering um, and that there is a dramatic decrease after the flowers were cured. So they had these clones, um, I'm sorry, just grab my notes from here. So, um, You can see here that this is the weeks here. So they were flowering and then they were not detected until week seven of flowering. Um, and then after that, the increase in concentration was significant. And at week 10 is when they were cut and dried. This week 11 measurement is after 11 days of curing at where these concentrations reached a maximum. And the week 12 measurement is 10 days after the flowers were cured. And you can see noticeably that the VSC concentration decreases in all of these compounds, except for in VSC5, which they hypothesize may be due to the oxygen that's in this, that, um, that's in this VSC that's not in any of the other VSCs. And they suppose that this oxygen may give that VSC more um, stability because of hydrogen bonding between the oxygenated functional group and the thioacetate group of that VSC. And then this is just a table to um, exemplify what I was talking about earlier, where they measured the same cultivar 42 days apart, and the total detected BSC concentration decreased by about a third in that time. So this is some questions that they um, hypothesized for at the end of the paper about future research um, using this Graphic on the left, can we quantify or correlate freshness with VSC uh, concentration or quality? And how does packaging and sample storage play a role in the stability of these VSCs over time? And they hypothesize that um, based on the trends that they saw that these VSCs will decrease dramatically over time. So conclusions and takeaways. Um, they, there are different non-terpene compounds responsible for the skunk-like smell. VSC3 is the main compound for the characteristic smell associated with gassy cannabis, and it's the most odor-contributing VSC discovered that contain this prenal functional group. Um, packaging may affect VSC concentration, sample age affects VSC concentration, and VSCs increase significantly towards the end of the flowering stage of growth. And they also decrease significantly 10 days after the curing process is complete. Um, and then they also went on and took it another step and identified these same compounds in cannabis extracts using butane hash oil as sample matrices. And that is the end of my presentation. I just wanted to acknowledge um, Ian and all the other collaborating authors, the team at Abstracts Tech and Labs, 
Andrew for inviting me to give this presentation and the Journal Club for listening to the presentation. Thank you guys. And here are some references and I think we'll have a brief Q&A now. Thank you so much Twinkle, that was really, really great. I just am such a nerd for all these 2D uh, plot charts uh, as an analytical chemist, it just really gets me going. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. So if anyone else wants to add, uh, please take the time now to do so. Um, this is going to be like at most 15 minutes to strictly answer questions. Uh, remember, Twinkle does work at Abstract. She's not an author on this paper, but I'm sure she can answer to the best of her abilities. Um, for the first one from an anonymous attendee says, for headspace sampling, do you grind the samples before loading? Yes, they do grind them. Um, because you want to homogenize your samples before doing that, but also because um, these VSCs are really volatile, so they wanted to release them from their matrices to give them the best chance of headspace detection. Kind of on that note, um, was there a reason you chose headspace versus direct injection? Were there some problems with direct injection, or is it simply just a cleaner uh, injection with the headspace? So I think in at the time of this paper, they were going for headspace just specifically because the volatile nature of these sulfur compounds and they wanted to have the most intense concentration of them. But since then, um, since I started working there, we have experimented with direct injection and seen some interesting data. So we may be exploring that further in the future now. Yeah, that's really cool. And the, it's pretty interesting. There is a there is a pretty big debate among uh, third party labs whether direct injection or headspace is more appropriate for terpenes. But of course, uh, since there's no standard procedure, we don't really know. Uh, so Mark Kelm is asking, how are artifacts ruled out? Could any of these sulfur compounds result from analysis? Um, that is a great question. I do not believe that any of these could have resulted um, from analysis, I'm assuming he's talking about like the heating and degradation of products that may occur during GC analysis. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how they ruled out artifacts, but you know, you can always do um, blank tests to ensure like blank sample matrices to ensure that uh, your sampling procedure and analysis procedure aren't creating artifacts. So I, I assume that they did something to that effect and that the fact also that they were able to see different um, different VSCs and different concentrations of VSCs in these different cultivars, I think gives them the confidence that they weren't artificially creating anything. Got it. Uh, Bob Chapman has asked, can you comment if the loss over time is simple evaporation or oxidation of the compounds? So um, I would say that I would say it's neither evaporation or oxidation. I would use the term dissipation or depletion. Um, and I think that we kind of see this every day. If you've been around cannabis or you smell cannabis, you know that it has a diffuse um, but distinct aroma, meaning that even if you open something that smells gassy or skunky and then close it, those smells kind of linger in the air afterwards. And that's just due to the high vapor pressure and volatile nature of these VSCs. So I do not think that it's fair to say that it's oxidation. Um, I guess you could technically say that that's evaporation, but I would prefer to use the term dissipation. Yeah, I'm with you there. Technically evaporation is a phase change. And these are just kind of a just off gassing. More than They're anything. just diffusing. Yeah. Yeah, we all know what it smell like. <laughs> uh, Nick Jacqueline has asked, great presentation, thank you. Do you know if these individual molecules are available in pure form, synthetically produced, perhaps as reference materials? Great question, Nick. Um, so the, the researchers of this paper actually had these molecules customly synthesized to confirm their structure so they ordered custom synthesis of these products um, to be a form of reference material. I know that not all of them, they were able to synthesize in super high purities, but they were able to use that to confirm um, and then quantify uh, these compounds. So I think maybe if you want to reach out, I could try to put you in touch with the company that does the synthesis, but I'm not too sure if these are just on the shelf compounds, but I could be wrong. 
Um, on that note, uh, I was kind of under the assumption that abstracts would try to synthesize and purify this for their own company. Um, what did they? What have they done with the? Uh, this kind of R&D research uh, in terms of, I guess, product development? I know there's a patent that they have, right? Yes, yeah, so they um, do, I think they still externally source raw materials and isolates, but then they use these compounds in their terpene blends. And we use the data from 2DGC to reverse engineer um, these botanically derived terpene blends to closely mimic uh, the scent of real cannabis that we can identify through these 2D chromatograms that we rep that are representative of this different cultivars. Yeah, that really sounds like a lot of fun. It's like playing God with terpenes, right? It's really cool. It's, it's honestly a really interesting thing that I ha did not have a lot of knowledge of before I joined this company. Hey, our friend Justin Binder writes, do you have any insight into whether the VSCs are produced by the cannabis plant or they can be produced by micro biological population from the flower over time? Um, so I, I can only, we can only theorize and hypothesize about this because we did not monitor any microbiological populations, but based on the indoor grow experiment that they did, I would say it's a, it's a fair um, hypothesis that they are produced by the cannabis plant. And the fact that there are those prenol groups that are functionalized and created in other cannabinoids and flavonoids, I feel like that that is indicative that the plant actually does synthesize them. I'm inclined to agree with you there. I find it very unlikely that this is a microbrite product. I guess uh, in cheeses or something like that, it would make sense. <clears throat> but uh, cannabis seems a little less likely. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, chemistry that we're not really sure about what happens like during curing of that. So it's an interesting thought that, you know, these could be enhanced during curing, maybe through some kind similar to cheeses, like with the microbiological population, but I'm not sure that that's what's happening here. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Twinkle? <clears throat> In the meantime, uh, just please put them in the chat if you do. Uh, could I have a personal question going back? You mentioned these VSCs might be also found in something like durian. Uh, what other kind of things did you try and look for it in? So actually just recently, um, Ian, the primary researcher for this, was interested in looking for this in a, a, I can't remember exactly what, but some type of gourd or squash that's native to Southern California. And basically he was just out hiking and noticed the skunky aroma coming from one of these, I wanna say it was a coyote squash. Um, so we actually analyzed that to determine if there were VSCs in it, um, which I'm, to be honest, not quite sure if there were or were not, but they were, they know for sure that they also found them in um, skunk spray. I don't think they themselves analyzed skunk spray, but I think there is enough research out there to correlate the compounds. Got it. Uh, but you did do durian? I don't know if they did durian. Uh, I'll have okay. to get back to you on that. Yeah, I uh, have a lot of horror stories about people bringing durian into work. It's just <laughs> a disaster for everyone. Yeah, a lot like cannabis, it's very divisive where you either really like it or you really don't. And I think that that's true for the scent of cannabis too. Although in the industry, um, we forget that people don't love the way it smells. Yeah, at this point, I'm not even sure I smell it anymore. <laughs> uh, Nick Jacqueline has one last question. I guess what's the best way to get in touch? Oh, for sure. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and or my email is my first and last name at abstractstech.com, um, which I will put this slide up here so you can see how to email me twinkle.pariani at abstracts with an x tech.com. Awesome. Well, if there aren't any further questions, uh, Twinkle, thank you so much for your presentation. It's really very much appreciated. And everyone here I know is uh, smarter for it. Uh, everyone, thank you again for joining this month's Cannabis Chemistry Subdivision Journal Club. Uh, it's, we are hosted 
at the last Thursday of every month. <clears throat> Our next one will be in August, on August 25th. Uh, we don't have a speaker quite lined up yet, so if you want to volunteer, we would very much appreciate it. You can reach out to me directly. Uh, I'm Andrew Pham, the Publications Chair. <clears throat> and so you can email me at publications at can-acs.org. Uh, once again, just a reminder, we do have the ACS National Meeting coming up. So if you are interested, you can uh, register in person or attend virtually. I think most people are going to be attending virtually. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. And thank you again so much, Trico, for your presentation. Yes, one last thing, actually, Andrew, I just wanted to plug um, the QR code for the paper is in the top right. So if you haven't checked out the paper yet, you can go ahead and do that. And I actually believe that Ian, the primary researcher of this paper, will be presenting at that ACS conference next month. So you can watch him give a talk on a much more detailed and um, comprehensive view of this paper. Awesome. Uh, for your information, everyone, I also put a direct hyperlink to the paper in the chat if you want to access it. It is not behind a paywall, which is amazing. So thank you, CS Omega. And uh, yeah, everyone, have a great day. Thank you for joining us and see you next month.